In 1879, the Reverend James William Adams was the first clergyman to be awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions at the Battle of Kilakazi in the Second Afghan War. Under the terms of the Geneva Convention, which obviously Britain is a signatory to, chaplains are classed as medical personnel, as ambulance personnel. So the role of a chaplain in action is with the wounded. And this role uh, for the chaplain is underlined by the award of the First Victoria Cross, um, awarded to a chaplain during the First World War, and this is awarded early in 1916 by Noel Mellish for his work in rescuing the wounded at St. Alwa on the Western Front. And what that award does is really put the seal on the work of the chaplain when in action, when in the front line and when in action. And during the course of the First World War, hundreds of chaplains are decorated for their work with the wounded while under fire. There were examples throughout the history of the chaplains of intense bravery. And I've certainly had uh, experience of finding reports uh, on people who were awarded the Military Cross. And that award is one that's given for gallantry, for doing something way beyond what is normally expected. And two particularly stand out, both from the 231st Brigade, which was part of the 74th Yeomanry Division in Palestine, uh, they're both uh, Welsh people. Uh, one's an Anglican, one's a Welsh Baptist. The Welsh Baptist, Abram Rees Morgan, and during the Third Battle for Gaza, uh, he and others were involved in the rescuing of wounded soldiers from the battlefield during the battle. And in recognition of that, he was awarded the Military Cross. But nowhere in his correspondence does he mention this. He wasn't unique by any stretch of the imagination because his colleague, who was also from the same brigade, William Alquin Jones, he also won the Military Cross. He was awarded the first MC uh, during the approach march to, uh, to Jerusalem, uh, having been engaged in a very fierce action. Um, and he was recognized for his bravery and his hard work. And then just after the, uh, the Battle of Jerusalem, he's involved in another engagement, which again he is involved in rescuing people, and he's awarded a bar to his military cross, and that is certainly unusual. So those two young men were just examples of many chaplains who did some very brave things, and many of them were not recognised because there weren't sufficient people around to know about their action. One of the Victoria Cross winners during the First World War was a man called Theodore Bailey Hardy. And he was an Anglican chaplain that joined later on in life. And he was well known for being in trenches like this and going out into no man's land in the pitch black, in the dark, after the offences were over, when all was quiet apart from the cries of the injured. And he would go out and he would spend time comforting for those who couldn't bring back and those who could, you know, seeking to bring them back or at least tell the stretcher bearing party where the injured were so they could be collected as soon as possible. And again and again, he went out time and time again to, to, to find the wounded, uh, to give them a sip of water to pray with them and then sort out their rescue. And whenever he came back, uh, just so he wouldn't be shot, he used to say the words, it's only me, lads, it's only me and they know it was their padre and they wouldn't open up on him uh, and he'd come back to the trenches. The man not only won, who won the VC, he won a DSO and an MC as well. Extremely brave man. During the Great War, military chaplains received three Victoria Crosses, 81 Distinguished Service Orders and a total of 571 military crosses. Morale, obviously, is a very multifaceted concept. Um, 
People have to believe in what they're fighting for. They have to feel comfortable or as comfortable as possible in the situation they're placed in. And chaplains address both of those uh, types of morale. Chaplains do preach about the justice of the cause. Now, this doesn't mean to say that they preach hate-flecked sermons against the Germans. The chaplains tend to major on the necessity for sacrifice, the necessity to be Christ-like, literally Christ-like, in helping to create and to forge a better world, to sacrifice in order that things can be better. This is very much a light motif of chaplains preaching throughout the war. They preach also on um, the justice of the cause more generally, why Britain is fighting. Obviously, um, when America comes into the war and after President Wilson issues his 14 points, they preach about um, the rights of self-determination. Ironic, perhaps, given that Britain is an empire. But nonetheless, even before that, they preach about the rights of small nation, the duties of standing up to international bullies, as it were. And they do preach about the justice of the British cause, which is a justice which they fundamentally believe in themselves, because they're all volunteers. And there is a very strong sense of moral conviction in British society at this time that Britain is actually doing the right thing. So chaplains do address morale in that respect. But in terms of making life more comfortable to the soldiers, they are extremely active in organising sports, in providing welfare activities of various kind, recreational activities, and famously, in the case of Talbot House at Popperinger near Ypres, in providing a soldier's home, a soldier's institute, which is frequented by tens of thousands of soldiers between 1915 and 1918. So chaplains are very active in promoting um, the morale of British soldiers. We have a perception, perhaps, of people being in the trenches for four years. Well, that's not entirely true. They were involved in the trenches for four years, but they weren't on the front line for all that time. Uh, very, very few people would have spent a considerable amount of time on the front. They, they tried to rotate the units uh, regularly because it's impossible to keep people clean and tidy and to make sure that they're effective um, if they're not replaced. Because of the way that the world was fought with troops not continuously in the front line um, and also a very, very large number of troops actually providing the logistical support behind the front line, quite a lot of soldiers had spare time and occasionally you know, a bit of money. And so there was quite a, an industry to meet the needs of the soldiers. And, and chaplains found themselves actually trying to compete with some of the things that they saw as their savoury. I mean, they, they weren't the only ones, but they were particularly concerned about the incidence of venereal disease amongst troops uh, and about ways in which that could be combated. Um, and one of the reasons that they sometimes got called holy grocers was that they were trying to do things um, that would keep people out of the bars um, and out of what they saw as trouble. Um, and so they would provide dry canteens where it was only soft drinks or particularly tea. And vast amounts of tea got drunk. And organised sporting competitions, football particularly, but cricket in summer, uh, so that people had something else to do. And they saw this as uh, part of their way of, of helping soldiers cope with, with the war uh, and, and also, of course, being available to them. And there were a lot of clergy, not just chaplains, who were working with the YMCA, uh, the Scottish Church Huts, the Church Army, uh, the Wesleyans, who were providing these quite extensive area of, of what were called huts behind the front line, where soldiers could find something that was a home from home. And these were often the places where the voluntary services would be held in, in the evening into which the soldiers would go, and where the chaplains would meet them. And you get a lot of uh, chaplains' memoirs talking about their work in them. And in, as the war developed, Often a chaplain would spend his first two or three months in a base area in one of these huts so that the uh, senior chaplains could judge how well he'd gone on with, with men and how, if he could talk to them or not because some chaplains clearly found it easier to relate to men uh, than others did. And if you didn't relate to them, there was absolutely no point sending you to the front line because you just wouldn't be accepted. And Woodbine Willie almost certainly got his name, not because he handed out Woodbines, but because he started his career as a chaplain in a hut which was called the Woodbine Hut. The importance of civilian religious welfare agencies in the support of British, Australian, Canadian, New Zealand soldiers 
cannot be understated in the course of the First World War. In many respects, their role has only recently been rediscovered by historians. The YMCA operated the largest philanthropic enterprise ever mounted by British society during the course of the First World War. YMCA facilities, whether centres, huts, etc., were legion, not only in Great Britain, but across the theatres of war. Not only did the YMCA create huts, recreational huts, welfare huts for soldiers, but they were also involved in a wide range of work with soldiers' families, including, for example, the bringing of uh, next of kin over to France, over to France in the middle of the war, to visit mortally wounded soldiers or fatally sick soldiers in base camps. The YMCA's work during the course of the First World War was sensational. It had never been done before. It humanised the army. It created a very visible link between the churches and the British soldier. And in many respects, it was very much a, a multi-party effort. Anglicans, Methodists, Baptists, Catholics and Jews got behind the work of the YMCA. It was a phenomenal effort. But in addition to the YMCA, which is multi-denominational, you also have the efforts of the church army, the Anglican Church Army, the Catholic Women's League, the Scottish Churches Huts, etc. There is a host of religious organisations which throw themselves into the support, uh, religious, moral, spiritual and educational, of the British soldier during the First World War. Chaplains in base camps who tended not to get much of the limelight, obviously, because that was fixed very much on their peers in frontline units or with frontline units. Many of these worked very closely with the YMCA and with these various welfare organisations, creating what you might regard as a more civilised, more caring institution into which these millions of accidental soldiers are actually precipitated by the war. The army that filled these trenches, the British army that filled these trenches was a British Empire army. It had people from all kinds of backgrounds, uh, different religions and different ethnicities uh, that were serving in British Army uniform. And the YMCA Huts was one place that people of any kind of background could go to to find Christian warmth and friendship uh, and have time away from the intensity of the trenches and if they're in the labour corps, the intensity of digging the trenches that people are going to move in and be able to, to sit around and relax in a Christian environment. Uh, the West Indies regiments, for instance, had their own chaplains, uh, as did the Indian ecclesiastical establishment. But it was more a challenging environment uh, because you had uh, you know, the West Indian soldiers, for instance, finding it very hard to deal with the uh, cold weather and not having the equipment to keep themselves warm. But at least the YMCA was there to provide some alleviation of that suffering. YMCA chaplains volunteered to serve in France, in Belgium, Salonika, Egypt, anywhere where there was YMCA huts. And they would work from those huts to, to look after the physical welfare of the soldiers they had responsibility for, right from writing letters to give them uh, you know, a decent drink and a nice bit of food. The important thing was to create a Christian environment where soldiers could relax and enjoy fellowship together, uh, you know, have time to pray in the prayer room, uh, and often attend services led by the chaplains from the regiments that would often use those uh, huts. The most famous uh, hut chaplain was probably Gypsy Smith, a very famous evangelist that uh, was well known internationally in America and in Britain and had led many, many people to Christ through his rallies and his writings. And he tells about working for the huts that he really worked very hard uh, on the social welfare of the soldiers and he felt this was just as important as his gospel mission. Uh, that the care of Christ represented in his care was just as important as the, the, the message of Christ that would lead to people get right with God. Oswald Chambers, who became well known through the later publications of his teachings, such as My Utmost for His Highest, volunteered to be a YMCA hut chaplain in Egypt. He was well respected and loved by the soldiers he served. He died in Egypt in 1917 due to complications after an operation to remove his appendix. His funeral was well attended by many of the soldiers he had impacted 
through his ministry in the camps. The Salvation Army was very keen to support their soldiers. They put their work underneath the authority of uh, Salvationist Brigadier Murray, and she uh, was an experienced Salvationist who, who led the work out in South Africa during the Boer War. And so they put all the Salvation work underneath her leadership. And of course they ran huts, they ran canteens, and they were very keen, unusually for that period, to promote the work of not only women, but working class women. They worked in every area they could, mainly behind the lines, but some we know went forward, right forward, uh, these women, to, to launder the clothes of the soldiers right in the forward trenches. And there are a number of photographs which show that uh, work happening. And along with them, of course, doing their official duties, eventually they managed to get five commission chaplains into the Royal Army Chaplains Department, who served with great effect, uh, one dying of influenza later on in the war. So they really did work very hard for their soldiers. They worked very hard to promote uh, women's ministry in that period. And they worked very hard, of course, to promote uh, the gospel whenever they could. And certainly in many of the memoirs and many of the descriptions uh, of revival activity or gospel activity going on, it was going on by soldiers who were salvationists. So though in a different uniform now, and if you like serving in a different kind of way, they never forgot their roots and they never forgot uh, to share their faith or either to preach and to proclaim the good news whenever they could. One chaplain of significance was Ernest Lodge Watson. He was one of the first United Board chaplains to serve in the British Expeditionary Force and he was an Australian uh, from Queensland and he was a revivalist. He was a man who believed passionately that the gospel of Christ could change people's lives. In fact, unless they come through the gospel of Christ, they, they couldn't be right with God. And so this was a really significant thing for him. And again and again, he is revealed, often being in a YMCA hut, and, and with great music and great singing. He was a great singer, apparently, very loud and robust. Uh, one description by George Kendall, a, a fellow Padre, talks about him stamping on the floorboards uh, in time with the music and getting the, the soldiers uh, you know, to rise up with their singing and really preaching his heart out. And the central of his message was uh, the love of God in Christ. Uh, he would definitely plead with them uh, and would say you know, they need to get right with God and they, and they need to come forward and this is their opportunity. He's pretty, pretty you know, front and honest and, and if you like, it, it, in their face uh, about the need to be committed. And it tells us that there was always a great response to Ernest Lodge Watson's preaching. Um, George, George Kendall says that whenever Ernest Lodge Watson is preaching, uh, there's always a response, there's always an act. People always wanted to go and listen to him. And whenever he was known to be preaching, people would pack his services out because I think he was probably not only a great preacher, but an entertainer too. So suddenly the British Army was flooded with these energetic Christians, both in the ranks as soldiers uh, and as young officers. Uh, and of course as chaplains. And, and so what you had was a real vibrancy of evangelical vision. And wherever they could, uh, in, in big meetings, in voluntary services, described effectively by Ernest Lodge Watson and William Cram Charteris uh, and Paris Williams and, uh, and other chaplains, where they would do these services and people would turn up in masses. And you're talking about in the hundreds and in the fifties. To, to small gatherings where they'd go to a small tent and find soldiers just waiting for them, laying down praying before the service. Uh, Frederick Humphrey describes that the soldiers were, were, he almost had to climb over them to get to the place he was going to speak because the, chap, uh, the, the soldiers were so earnestly laying on the floor and praying for the effects of the service that he felt almost embarrassing to walk in and begin the service. Uh, and so what he had there was very much a kind of lively uh, evangelical faith uh, which was stronger in some battalions than others, depending on where they were recruited and how they were held together. So you might describe it um, as very sporadic in the layout of where these things occurred. We know too that there's lots of examples of, of soldiers writing little notes to their farmers at home, to their mother, to their wives or to the children, uh, saying things like, you know, Daddy was saved on, 
and they put the dates and then they would put it inside their pocket or tie it, pin it inside their um, tunics. And, and this was very, very common, according to some of the sources actually written at the time, uh, that, that soldiers were doing this kind of thing. There are other researchers who looked at um, the potential or possible revival in France, and there are certainly examples of how, in small places, there may well have been some short-term revivals. Um, they were different to what we'd experienced in Wales in 1904 or 5. It was more to do with mission and the mission to help those young men who were fighting to realise that God was there with them as well, that they didn't feel that everybody had forgotten about them. And I think that probably had a great deal of influence on how some of the young men wanted to come to Christ or wanted to reaffirm their connection to Christ. In the Egyptian and Palestinian examples that I have, there certainly seems to be a lot of focus on church activities and that the chaplains were very, very hard work there. And there's also some examples of how people coming together, relating back to their previous uh, experience of uh, revival in, in South Wales uh, in the early part of the century, may have felt that kind of fervour again. It was a security for them, it was something that kept them together. And Abram Rees Morgan's letters do reflect that. And there's one particular instance where he talks quite um, strongly about this feeling of revival. On the 27th of March, 1917, Morgan wrote his 10th letter to his church. And in this letter, he relates back to the 1904-05 revival. And he says this, on Wednesday night, we had a very remarkable gospel service at the YMCA hut. There were some hundreds present and they all listened reverently to the gospel message. I realised more than ever my tremendous responsibility as Christ's ambassador. The meeting was preceded by a prayer meeting in the devotional hut when 18 men, several of whom were ministers and students, offered fervent prayer for God's blessing. These prayers were truly answered, for we all felt that the Spirit of God was present. Immediately after the service, we again repaired to the devotional hut for prayer, and this time it was crowned and crowded out, and the whole tenor of the meeting was the character of a revival. Young men offered public prayer for the first time, and were it not for the restrictions as to time, we should have been there until a very late hour. Last night, we had another prayer and praise meeting in the devotional hut, and we all felt greatly refreshed. There are examples, um, for instance, uh, David Williams, a chaplain with the 53rd uh, Welsh Division, talks about the competitiveness of their hymn singing. Um, in the rest camps. And again, he's talking about an early revival kind of idea of the young men coming together and the singing was part of the devotion. And he really um, excels here with, with the, the hymn singing and the fervour that the young men were bringing into their prayer and devotions. Going back to Abram Rees Morgan, in one of his letters he notes that he had the privilege of baptising two soldiers on Sunday the 30th of September 1917. A whole battalion of officers and men witnessed the men's profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I trust it led many to consider the claims of Jesus on their lives. In the evening, I recited to them the church covenant and extending to them on behalf of their respective churches the right hand of fellowship. We afterwards partook of the Lord's Supper and truly felt the presence with us." So those are two examples of how Morgan experienced not just ordinary church life, but church life in a very different circumstance where people were on the one side coming to God through Christ and on the other side preparing to do battle with the enemy and many would die in that process. Coming up in World War I, military chaplains part four. 
we'll look at chaplains who served in the Palestine campaign and the battle for Jerusalem. We also look at the way people would remember and mourn the lives that were lost in the Great War.